got a problem right now. We're going to take care of it. Hi, everybody. My name is Dan. I'm an addict. And this is a trip. Because you know what? It reminds me of, uh, well, let me put it this way. I know you're watching me, but I can't see most of you. You know what I'm saying? Is everybody having a good time? I can honestly say that I've never had this much fun with a wristband on. <laughs> you know, most of the time if I had a wristband on, something bad had just gone down, you know what I mean? But I am having a blast here. I, I want to I reach out to anybody that's new to Narcotics Anonymous and say that if this weekend you haven't learned that we can have fun and live and enjoy our lives in recovery, keep coming back. Yeah. When I first got to uh, recovery, and Narcotics Anonymous, and um, people talked about complete abstinence from all drugs. I was in a treatment center, and they said complete abstinence from all drugs. And I was like, oh, no way. It's a little drastic, you know what I mean? <laughs> Come on. What about me? What about the guy that only had a problem with certain drugs? Because, you know, addiction and withdrawal distort rational thought. And I was looking for ways to disprove the evidence of my addiction and disqualify myself from recovery. But now I come to a place like this and I see everybody and, and playing volleyball in the pool. And most importantly, when I hear the responsibility statement, I love that stuff. Because where else in the world can you go where there's 800 adults? All right? And somebody has to get up and say, all right, listen, act like an adult. <laughs> Pick up after yourself. If you stay up all night, don't keep everybody else up. That's Narcotics Anonymous right there. Yeah. So, you know, if you're new, regardless of your past thoughts or actions or what side of the tracks you come from or the new projects or the old projects or who your connections were, and none of that stuff matters, man. We just love that you're here, and we're so glad that you're here, and welcome here. Um, I tell you, I was sitting out on the beach earlier today, and I had my basic text out. I was getting into the literature a little bit, and uh, I looked up at the, at the Caribbean. This is the Caribbean, right? A little Caribbean inlet? Whatever it is. But it was It was beautiful. And I'm laying there on the beach and there's a meeting going on behind me and people are sharing from their heart. And there's palm trees swaying and I looked up and I thought, how in the world did I end up here? Yeah. How in the world did I end up here? And I'm flipping through my literature, you know, and uh, Matt was talking last night about being stuck on the block, right? Now, I'm listening to Mac and I'm relating to what he's saying. Now, obviously I don't come from a large black family. <laughs> And I don't come from the projects. I'm a yuppie from the suburbs. Check it out. But I related to the desperation. Oh, yeah. And, you know, many of us, well, we sought answers and didn't find any workable solution until we found each other. And I'm so glad I found you guys. And I'm sitting out on the beach this morning and I'm thinking about how I got here. And I open up my book and I'm reading and there's this passage that jumps out at me and it says, if we had written down our list of expectations when we came into recovery, we would have been cheating ourselves. Oh, yeah. That hopeless living problems have been joyously changed, our disease has been arrested, and now anything is possible. Yeah. And here I am. You know, anything is possible. I just don't even believe it right now. I, uh, I didn't know anything about living when I got to Narcotics Anonymous. I didn't know anything about living and enjoying my life without the use of drugs, you know? And I learned the rap real quick, okay? I learned the N.A. rap quick. I, I can pick that stuff up, you know what I mean? If I need to fit into a group, I'll fit into a group. 
But it was obvious to the members that I didn't know what the hell was going on. <laughs> and it was probably more obvious, if not as obvious, outside of the meeting as it was inside of the meeting. People would be outside of the meeting circling up and talking about life stuff, about watching their kids play Little League, getting promotions in their jobs, and just life stuff. And the conver conversation would come around to me, and I'd just be standing there. And I'd say something stupid, like, did you ever huff oven cleaner? <laughs> you know, I did, it gave me a headache. Did you ever huff oven And it's like, they just looked at me like, dude, just keep coming back, man, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but as a result of working 12 steps and 12 traditions, uh, and, you know, experiencing my recovery through the 12 steps, because really that's our goal, not mere physical abstinence in Narcotics Anonymous, is that I have, I have got a clue how to live. I've learned all these wonderful things, you know. I've learned that I can love other people, you know. And I've allow them to love me. And I'm talking about that kind of love that I never thought could ever happen, where you just, it's like I put my heart out, you know, and I put it in the hand of another addict, just right there, pulsing, and I, and I trust that they're not going to stab it or throw it in the corner. They're just going to love me. And I've learned that here. And I've learned that maybe I have a purpose, you know, maybe that there's a reason that I'm here. And I just, I was floating around in such a sea of isolation and destruction and despair before I got here. And I really believe that the world is probably just a little bit better place now that I've been here. And I sure couldn't say that before I got here. And I think the world is a better place that all of us are here. And I love Narcotics Anonymous. You know? I didn't always love Narcotics Anonymous. My first experience with Narcotics Anonymous was in a treatment center. And they said, here, all the NA people are coming. And you know what? You heard them way before you saw them. Because here come the hearties. And they all come And I wasn't allowed to go in because I was in detox. But I, you know, I peeked my head around the corner and here come them NA people. All tatted back. Leather. Sunglasses inside. There, there wasn't enough teeth in the whole room to make one mouthful, I guarantee you that. That's, that's what I saw. Again, addiction and withdrawal just throw a rational thought. I was looking for ways to disqualify myself from recovery. But I looked at you guys, I was like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. They got to do something about themselves. Look at them, for God's sake. Because I wasn't like you guys. I didn't ride motorcycles. The cars I borrowed were a lot nicer than the cars you drove. <laughs> I never stuck a needle in my arm because my misconceptions of the nature of addiction included visions of violence, street crime, dirty needles, and jail. Just like it says in Who is an Addict. And I'll refer to that a lot because it parallels my story. You see, but then I ended up um, in this treatment center and I was in a protected environment. And they were talking about complete abstinence from all, dr all drugs. And people in the meetings and whatever meetings that were coming in and talking, they were all saying the only way it would work, the only chance I had was complete abstinence. As a matter of fact, they went beyond that. They said, you must completely change your old ways of thinking or go back to using. Oh my God. Oh my God. And I heard that and I didn't think I could do it. I was afraid because all of my life up until that point, I had failed right before the end. I had stopped just before I finished. I could never complete anything because I was in the grips and I didn't know if I could do it. There was a little part of me that didn't think I would ever be able to make it. But see, it was the people in the fellowship that gave me hope. You guys gave me hope by insisting that I could recover. Tonight, this countdown, we had somebody with 47 years clean. Is that what it was? Yep. Yeah. 
So if you're only 46, he's insisting you can make it to 47. That's right. And if you're the person with two days clean or one day clean, that person with three, they're just insisting you could do it for one more day. But you know, I, I ended up saying, hey, you know what, I'll give it a shot. And I ended up in a meeting and I was given a basic text. And I, in that basic text, there were no tattoos on the outside of that basic text. There wasn't any skin color. There wasn't anything that would block me out from hearing the message of recovery, that life-saving message of Narcotics Anonymous. And, uh, you know, here I stand now. I'm going to talk a little bit about what it was like before I came to Narcotics Anonymous. And not about who my connections were or how much I had or any of that stuff, but a little bit about that, that deeper level of empathy and emotions about how we feel and how we think as addicts. And, and I'm not going to stand on that too long, but I, I believe that our meetings are a process of identification, hope, and sharing. And sometimes when we're new, the only things we can relate to are the feelings of what it was like just before we got here. You know... Our second step, and it works how and why, says much of our problems seem to center in a search of something to make us feel whole, right? And for that, man, when I first put that first drug in my system, man, not only did I feel whole, I felt a whole lot bigger. I felt, like, big, you know what I mean? And bad things started to happen right away. I'll tell a story. In high school, I went to a party, and I was going to show everybody that I wasn't five foot nothing, that I wasn't a hundred nothing. And I had a, you know, a bottle here and a little bag there, and I went to this party, and I got blind. I mean, blind. And uh, I didn't know what had happened at all. And when I started using drugs, you guys, one of the first things that happened is my life changed so much instantly because everything became a secret. You know what I'm talking about? Everything in my life became a secret. And our literature talks about addicts tend to live secret lives, right? But for many years, we covered low self-esteem by hiding behind these phony images we hope would fool people. Unfortunately, we fooled ourselves more than anyone. And uh, although we often appeared attractive and confident on the outside, we were really hiding a shaky, insecure person on the inside. Now, I know how that felt. So I went to that party, and I was look, trying to look attractive and confident on the outside, and I got blind. And I had to go to school the following school day and face all the other kids at school. And they all knew what happened. I didn't have a clue what happened, all right? But I stuck my chest out and I walked into the schoolyard and the girl that threw the party came up to me and I was trying to look cool. And she said, did you have a good time at the party this weekend, Dan? And I was like, oh yeah, hell of a party. Thanks for having me. She goes, do you remember when my parents came home? <laughs> yeah, right. I was like, uh, no. Wasn't I gone by then? She said, no, 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 no. As a matter of fact, Dan, what happened was, is as soon as they came in, they pulled me aside and they pointed at you and they said, honey, we're so proud you invited that little retarded boy here to your party to share with everybody else. Yeah. And I was so humiliated. And the, I, so humiliated, but the only thing I could think, the only thing I could think was I have got to quit mixing alcohol and weed. <laughs> See, that's what made sense. Because we use drugs and combinations of drugs to cope with the scene of the hostile world. And I, man, I dreamed of finding that magic formula. You know what I mean? That magic formula that would solve my ultimate problem myself. And, you know, I proceeded through life and, and things started to get worse quick. I, you know, I got a job I, when I cheated my way through high school. And I had this job and it was a sales job, which was perfect for me. And I was selling shoes and I would sell shoes and I would sell a pair and I'd sell another pair, then I'd sell a pair and I'd put the money in my pocket. And I would say stuff like, you know, Dan, if they only paid you what you were worth, you wouldn't have to do that. You really wouldn't. Hey. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I rationalize the most outrageous sort of nonsense to justify the mess I made in my life with drugs at that age. And then, uh, you know, it was still an okay times though. I, I had no indication of the disaster that the future held for me at that point in time. And then uh, I was going to go on a date. 
okay? I've got a job, you know, I'm going to go on a date. Well, kind of in retrospect, and the, I didn't know how to date. Really, come on. How many addicts really know how to date? Like the whole concept of, you know, I'll take you out, we'll go to dinner, see if we like each other, drop each other off, you know, come on. <laughs> what I did was what we do. I picked her up, and our intention was to go on a date, and we went out, we used, we stayed up for a few days, and uh, I spent the next five years sucking the life out of her until it ended badly. This is exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Just, if you, if you would have me, I own you. <laughs> and you know, the sad thing is, is my intentions were good. I had good intentions, you know what I mean? I really, really did. But my addiction continued to progress, overpowering even my very best intentions. I mean, I would say stuff like, honey, I know this is our rent money, right? But if I get a really big bag, I can break it up into a bunch of little bags. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, you know, I'll sell it. We'll do a little bit, just a little bit, and I'll sell it. And we'll get all the money back plus some extra. And then it, it, pretty soon we'll have jet skis. I mean, look at, look at, look at this guy. And I, and you know what? And I believed me. And I might even get the big one, you know? And I might even waste three or four hours breaking it up into a bunch of little ones. <laughs> and then I'd do my share and I'd look at one and say, nobody's going to miss a little bit out of this one right here. <laughs> so I'd do a little bit out of that one, right? And then I'd go, well, now it's obvious I pinched this one. I better do some out of all of them. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, honey, it'll never happen again. And I believed me. <laughs> and I found myself doing the strangest things. Um, the, the most shameful things. Uh, you know, she would be at home waiting for me to return. And, and I would be somewhere like at uh, some adult bookstore at like 4 o'clock in the morning. Right? with this person waiting for me that cared about me, this beautiful girl waiting for me cared about me, and I would be like, just geezing somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and thinking at any minute, the DEA, my grandmother, and everybody that's ever known me was gonna bust in and catch me there, you know, in the scuzziest places on earth. And then it would all be over, and I'd be driving down the freeway, headed home, and the rest of the uh, world was going the opposite way on the freeway. They were all going towards downtown with their productive lives and their kids in their child seats, drinking their coffee. And I was going the other way. And I'd look over at the other side of the freeway and I would know deep in my heart, man, there's something wrong here. Failure and fear completely invaded my life. And, uh, this continued to happen and I went home and one day she came and she said, uh, I've met somebody that doesn't take me for granted. I've met somebody that doesn't lie to me. I've met somebody that doesn't spend our money. I've met somebody that really cares about me and obviously you don't. And she left. And you know, our book, you know, our book is so right on. It says many of us first saw the effects of our addiction on those closest to us. That we were very dependent upon them to carry us through life. And we felt angry, disappointed, and hurt when they found other interests, friends, and loved ones. That we regretted the past, dreaded the future, and weren't too thrilled about the present. That's exactly how I felt. So I moved. <laughs> Good idea, huh? And, uh... All it did was give me a chance to take advantage of new people. And uh, I moved to a little town called Auburn, California. And, uh, a lot of bad things happened in Auburn, California. A lot of wristband things happened in Auburn, California. Um, but I'm going to skip on past that and I'm going to get to the very end. At the very end, uh, I was broken inside. 
I wanted something different. I didn't know how to get it. I was desperate. I was afraid. I was just like our book talks about. You know, it says that uh, many of us forgot what it was like before we started using. That we acquired strange habits and mannerisms. Okay. See my eyes, see my little, you gotta see how your eyeglasses, right? This eye is 20-20 vision. This eye is 20-50. And I'm pretty sure it's from going like this. <laughs> Strange habits and manners. It talks about that, you know what? You know what I'm talking about. You do. And, uh, it says we forgot about the social graces. I didn't know what it was like to be social anymore. If I could crawl out of the closet that I used in long enough to go to a party, I just ended up in the closet at the party. <laughs> we forgot what it was like to work. I, didn't need, I got to that point where it was like, don't even, why even bother trying to get a job? I know I won't be able to make it. You know, and the last, the last day I used, I'm laying there and I'm in this little apartment and I done traded off all my stuff. And I have this, and I'm laying there and my heart's pounding through my chest. My arms are going numb, my palms are sweating and sweat's pouring off me. And my body ached for rest. But my mind wouldn't stop racing. My body ached for rest, but my mind wouldn't stop racing. And I'm laying there and I literally think this is the one that's going to do me in. This is the one that's going to kill me. This is the overdose that's going to take me. And I realized that I didn't want to die. And it wasn't because I had a lot to live for. That wasn't it at all. But I'm laying there, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to ever take another breath. And all I can think about is my mom. And my mom having to tell her sisters that her youngest son died a junkie. And I couldn't have it. I couldn't have that. And I told myself, I'm going to get clean. I'm going to get clean for a week. <laughs> and uh, it's a long freaking time. No doubt. No doubt. I heard a guy once say, if you don't think a week's a, hard, a long time, give your money the connection. If he says, I'll be back in a week, then will you think it's a long time? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and I'm laying there and I'm sure I'm not going to use and I have a little bit and this guy knocks on the door he says hey you got anything I says yeah I do and I said just take it take it into the kitchen man take it into the kitchen go ahead and do it I'm going to clean up and he takes it in around this little bitty kitchen and the kitchen wasn't far enough you know the next thing I know I found myself in there I pushed him away and I did what was left and it was at that moment that I knew that if I didn't have something different I was going to die you know there's that point where we can no longer deny the true nature of our problem. That all the lies and all the rationalizations and all the illusions, they just fall away. And I just, I stood there face to face with what my life had become. And the fact of the matter is I was living without any hope at all. And I didn't know where to find you. I did not know where to find you. I got in a borrowed vehicle and I drove to a treatment center in a town called Orangevale, California. And I walked in there and you know what? I was still trying to look good. I walked in there with snakeskin boots, an Izod shirt, Ray-Ban sunglasses, a little strut walking in, and I drove a borrowed 76 Toyota Corona that had fur on the dash, smelled like cat, and was four different colors. <laughs> Park in the alley and dress nice. That was my motto, you know what I mean? But I walked in there, and this woman looked at me, and she said, can I help you? And you know what, you guys, I just started bawling. I just lost it. I, uh, cause when you hear those words and you're ready to hear them, they're so powerful. Can I help you? And I started crying. I said, I hope so. I hope so. And she said, Oh, we have a waiting room for you. Just go wait in that room over there. And, and in comes this guy and he says, tell me about yourself. And I started telling this guy, uh, how much money I'd spent and just sobbing and sobbing. And I couldn't stop sobbing. And I was so ashamed of who I'd become. See, I didn't know that I was critically ill. I thought I was hopelessly bad. So our literature tells us that, that we don't suffer from a moral deficiency. 
And I talked to this guy and I told him everything. And he goes, we can help you here at this treatment center. Dan, well, this is the best treatment facility in Northern California. I was like, oh, God, thank you. God, thank you. And he says, uh, we have a 28-day inpatient program here that's fabulous. I was like, whoa. <laughs> whoa. Hold up, pal. See, I was already trying to backpedal. Just hours before that, I thought I was going to die. Hours before that, I was so desperate, I didn't know what to do. Hours before that, I was willing to just drive to someplace unfamiliar and walk in not having a clue. And he says, well, we do have outpatient, but not for you. I've heard your story. It's, you know, 28 days or nothing for you. And uh, he said, may I see your insurance card, please? It's like, dude. <laughs> I thought you were listening, Jack. You know what I mean? You didn't hear a freaking thing I said. Um, I didn't hear anything I said, man. And uh, he goes, well, he puts a phone up on this little table and he says, do you, do you know anybody with $10,000? <laughs> sure. <laughs> if I knew somebody, do you think I'd be here balling in your office if I knew somebody I could scope $10,000 from? But I got on the phone and I, you know, I called that one person, that one person who just her vision, just the vision of her having to tell her sister, she's just that wonderful woman, that salt of the earth person that my mother is. And I called her up and I said, Mom, I need your help. She said, I know, son. I know. See, I didn't think, I didn't think anybody knew. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's so screwed up about addiction. And we're the last ones to know that everybody knows, right? I mean, I'm 80 pounds running down the street with a bicycle on my back, and I don't think anybody knows. And I'm like, Mom, I need your help. They want $10,000. And my parents didn't, they didn't have that kind of money, but I didn't know where to go. And she talked to my dad. And what they did is they took the loan against their house. Because they're not wealthy at all. And they took what they had out of their bank accounts. And they drove down to that hospital. And they were there within no time at all. And they just looked at the guy. And they said, does this really work? Because, you know, it would be nice to have our son back. He's been missing for a long time. And the guy said, yeah, we have a great success right here. <laughs> and uh, my parents put the money on the table, you know, just willing to take a chance. And you know what? They took away all my clothes and they put me in a hospital gown and guess what? Wristband. <laughs> Wristband, man. That's right. And uh, I was terrible. I didn't know what to do, you know. Um, and so I went in and I detoxed, you know. And, and what happens is I got sick. I got, you know, I got really sick. And uh I woke up after a couple days and uh, I looked around and realized where I was and I was like, oh my God, what have I done? It wasn't that bad. You know what I mean? And again, our literature, I got to keep going back to our literature, it says, uh, we forgot about the times we sat alone and were consumed by fear and self-pity. We developed a pattern of selective thinking. We only remembered the good drug experiences. And you know what? That treatment center, 10 grand, they, they cleaned me up, detoxed me, and they introduced me to the program of Narcotics Anonymous. And I remember approaching my father about paying him that $10,000 back. And he said, no, you just keep putting dollars in those baskets, son, because those guys are working out just fine for you. Yeah. So this treatment center takes me to my first outside meeting of Narcotics Anonymous, right? It wasn't, uh, and so they put me in this little bus with these other guys. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Greggy Buggy, I like that. I'm taking that with you. And they take me to this meeting, right? And they sit down, and I'm thinking everybody's looking at me, you know. And then they say, we're going to do any related announcements. And this dude stands up and, you know, I, I got to jump off the subject here for a second. I, how many of you guys actually come from New York? Oh, 
Okay, just checking. Anyway, this guy stands up. He's got this heavy New York accent, right? And he says, yeah, my name's Ira. I'm your GSR. And I, I'm thinking CEO. I'm listening. like, no, this guy's got to be important. Everybody's being quiet. And I'm looking at him. And I'm like, hmm, let me check this out. And then he goes, oh, he starts talking alphabet soup, man. He goes, I'm your GSR. I went to the ASC and the ASR went down to the RSO and the RACM said that I, I was like, oh, I'm getting that fucker's job for sure. <laughs> if I was going to be here, I might as well run the place. You know what I'm saying? If I had to be here, I was going to run it. And then I realized I used to use with this dude. Now, I didn't like him when I used with him. He was from New York, man. He was obnoxious. But you know what? I didn't have to like you to use with you. I could fake it. But they told me at this treatment center I needed to get phone numbers, right? And I was like, wow, well, cool. At least I know somebody. Uh, I'll go get his phone number. There were no phone lists in... in uh, we had to go actually humble ourselves and go up and be willing and ask somebody for a phone number in those days. And then they introduced a speaker. And uh, she had four and a half years clean. Now, there was a lot of clean time here in Florida. I was blown away. I really was. You know, I'm from California, the birthplace of Narcotics Anonymous, but I was like, damn! But in 1990, in Sacramento, California, four and a half years clean was like old-timers panel. And her name was Ruth. And she was so beautiful. And she comes up, and she's blonde. She's my height. And I don't know one thing she said, but she was wearing a pink sweater and white Reeboks and faded blue Levi's. And I'm going to read something here for you. She had what I wanted, and I was willing to make the effort to get it. You know what I'm saying? She wasn't having a whole lot to do with me, probably the wristband. But anyway, I went over at break to talk to this guy, Ira, and get, my, give him my, get his phone number, and he's like, man, I'm so glad you made it here. I'm so glad you survived. So many of us don't make it here. And he, he had relearned the social graces and he said, wait a minute, wait right here, I don't wanna lose you." And he left and he returned a few moments later with a basic text of Narcotics Anonymous. And he put it in my hands and he said, I would like, to join, I would like you to join me and some other men every Thursday night to study the steps of Narcotics Anonymous because they are our solution. They are our survival kit. And he handed me a book. See, I didn't have to hear one word that Ruth said in my first meeting of Narcotics Anonymous. Another addict through their actions of selflessness and giving carried the message of Narcotics Anonymous to me by that simple gesture. And this was a guy that I could not stand. And he had relearned the social graces and he introduced me to this guy standing next to him and he said, hey, Matt, I'd like you to meet Dan. Dan's new. And I'm like, yeah, duh. And uh, <laughs> Matt says, Dan, do you have a sponsor? And I was like, no. Because I was still in treatment, you know, and I was still deciding whether I needed a sponsor or not. I was still reading the steps going, which ones applied to me, which ones don't. You know what I mean? <laughs> I wasn't going to get a sponsor. I was going to get Ruth. Well, it made sense. It really did. Why would I want to go to a meeting, a meeting a day for 90 days and work the steps and let alone try to find a power greater than myself when I could just hook up with this hot girl with four and a half years clean? She'd show me the ropes. Um, and Matt says, well, you know Ira. Ira's worked all the steps. He's been clean four and a half years. He's your sponsor. He's your sponsor. Here you go. 
Congratulations, now you have a sponsor. Mm. You guys want to take a moment of silence for that? Okay. Where was I? Ira. Ira. Sponsor. You, sponsor. And they gave me a sponsor at my first meeting in Narcotics Anonymous. And you know what? Our literature says that sponsorship is also the responsibility of the group. That it's implied and informal as its approach. That man, Ira, has been my sponsor for 17 years. And I love him so much, and he's always been a great example of the simplicity of Narcotics Anonymous. Um, and see, I wanted his job, right? <laughs> I did, man. I wanted his job, so I was the guy, I was the new guy in the meeting. Whenever the, the person was done talking, I was the first hand to shoot up at every meeting. Yeah, I'll share. You know, I'd have like 45 days clean. If you're new, listen up. You newcomers, keep coming back. Surrender. I didn't even know what surrender meant at all. Uh, I know what it means now. Believe me, I do. <laughs> oh, believe me. Um, and he never one time told me to shut up. He never one time said, you got nothing to offer here at Narcotics Anonymous, Dan. Shut up. And you know, some people, maybe you need a sponsor like that. I don't know, but that's not, that wasn't my case. What he would say was, Dan, how's that first step coming along? How is that first step coming? You know that help is only possible for addicts when we admit complete defeat, and it may be frightening, but it's the foundation upon which we built our very lives. You understand you're powerless, and when you manage your own life, you end up in Narcotics Anonymous. Yeah, it could be worse, right. How's step two coming down? You know, are you ready to be open-minded enough to maybe believe that there's a power out there that's greater than yourself, that's greater than your addiction, that can restore you to sanity? Um, and I really struggled with that, you guys. That was a hard step for me. But you know what our literature says? We, you know, we, we tried to gloss over it with minimal concern only to find out that the other steps wouldn't work. That's right. But I struggled with it. I did the best that I could. You know, our book talks about there's a spirit or energy that can be felt in our meetings. And sometimes this is the newcomer's first concept of a higher power. That was mine. But he just kept pressing me through the steps. He'd say, Dan, are you ready to make a decision? Just a simple decision. And by making this decision, man, I tell you, by surrendering our will, you know, you can be put in touch with a higher power that can fill that empty place inside that nothing could ever fill. And he just continued to press me through the steps, you know. How about the fourth step, Dan? The purpose of the fourth step is to sort through the contradiction and confusion of our lives and find out who we really are. That sounded good to me, man. I want to find out who I was. I was tired of not knowing. Because he knew that when I took the action indicated in the steps, the result would be a change in my personality. You know, We Do Recover talks about that. There's no model of the recovering addict. When we take the action indicated in the steps, the result will be a change in our personality. It's our actions that are important. We leave the results to our higher power. And so he just let the steps do the job. And eventually I realized, eventually, a long time later, I realized I didn't have to talk in every meeting in Narcotics Anonymous. Um, man, time's going by quick. Okay. So I started off with my campaign to be GSR. My first commitment was a coffee commitment. Best commitment there was, right? I'm not going to go into that too much, but I will say this. A group counted on me to carry the coffee pots to and from the meeting once a week. And then a situation arose where the obsession to use slammed into me like a truck. But I had these coffee pots. That's right. And the end of that story is, is I couldn't have it on my conscience that I pawned your guys' coffee pots. <laughs> So I got to the meeting, and by the time it was over, the obsession to use was gone.
and my sponsor taught me about service. You know, and I love that sponsor relationship I have with him and the, and the men I sponsor. And our, you know what? Our book says, our experience shows that those who get the most out of the Narcotics Anonymous program are those to whom sponsorship is important. So if you've you're been around here for a little while and you don't have a sponsor, why? I want the most out of what this thing has to offer. You know, and he pressed service. And you know what? Service is about carrying the message to the addict who still suffers. And my literature tells me the more eagerly I wait in and work, the richer my spiritual experience will be. Why wouldn't I want that? If you're not in service, why? Why wouldn't I want that? So when I was five months clean, GSR. Yeah! Um, they even waved the clean time for me. They knew. They knew. <laughs> and when I was five years clean, I realized nobody else wanted to do it. Uh, you know, that was kind of a drag. Well, I figured that out. Um, but then, you know, my first year was about going to meetings and being a service and, and having a sponsor working the steps. And I became GSR and I got kind of involved in the fellowship. And then it was time to get involved in H&I. Oh, yeah. It wasn't my idea that the police came and arrested me. <laughs> yeah, for something I'd done before I got clean. And I found myself in the eighth floor county lockdown in Sac County Jail in clothes that were a thousand times too big. Looking at the top of that cell, going, okay, God. I don't even know if you're there, man. I've just been doing the best I can with this thing. I've just been trying to plug in and trying to believe that others believe, but if you're there, you're wrong about this one. I don't belong in here. I'm a GSR guy. <laughs> I'm a member. I'm an important member. And I got out, and you know, I got bailed out, and I went to my sponsor, and I called him up. I was like, hey, sponsor, what should I do? They want to put me in jail for a while. And he's like, well, I suggest you work on your relationship with God. And I said, okay, and so I began this process of trying to develop this relationship with a power greater than myself, and I tried it through prayer, and you know what? It was uncomfortable for me. Prayer was uncomfortable. I didn't even know if I was talking to anything, and I felt awkward, and I felt stupid, and I didn't even really know any prayers. And I would be down on the knee, on my knees in the shower, and I, all I would do is, is I would uh, get out, and I would lay down, and I would open up our basic text to chapter 9, the italicized portion, and I would say, God, just for today. And that was my prayer. And that's not how I developed a relationship with my higher power. It took some time. You know, 11th step in the basic text, it talks about prayer takes practice. And skilled people weren't born with their skills. It took a lot of effort on their part to develop them. But what did connect me was having a home group of Narcotics Anonymous. I went to this group every week. When we had a home group, we'd go every week. And before I had become GSR at this group, or before I had become arrested, I watched this woman walk into this home group, right? And she walked in, and she dragged herself in. And she was about as beat up as a human being as I had ever laid eyes on in my life. She was maybe five foot nine. She probably weighed maybe 100 pounds soaking wet. She had a belt on, and it had like three extra holes punched in it just to hold up her dirty jeans. And her hair was all matted and ratty. And she had that look of just like a, the walking dead. You know what I mean? Her eyes were just vacant. And every week she came back to that meeting. And every week I came back. And every week we both came back to that meeting. And it was time for her to take her six-month chip. And they asked her to speak at the meeting. And she got up and she started talking. And she started telling her story about saying... I was a prostitute and I sold myself and I'd let my children be taken away by protective custodies because I just couldn't stop using. And I went to jail and I dug out of dumpsters and she was telling the story about needles and I was looking at her and I was and then I remembered what she liked when she what she looked like when she walked in. And then I saw the woman standing in front of me. And six months had gone by. And there she was, and her kids were quietly playing next to her with her color crayon. She had gotten them back. 
and her hair wasn't matted anymore. It was perfectly conditioned. And her skin wasn't picked at anymore. It was perfectly clear. And her eyes weren't vacant anymore. They were sparkling with life. And she had put on the weight and she wasn't skinny anymore. And she had this joy about her. And I looked at her and I realized, oh my God. Oh my God. Look at her. There's got to be a God in these rooms, man. Just look at her. Yeah. You know, it, it goes along the lines with our book. It talks about in there that uh, we can see evidence of a power that cannot be fully explained. And confronted with this evidence, we began to accept the existence of a higher power. You know what? We can only ignore the evidence for so long. And then I went and it was time for sentencing, right? But I was, I was plugged in. I, I felt comfortable. I could take this power with me wherever. And uh, my mother went with me. And my sponsor went with me and I sat in front of the judge and all you guys from NA, all you NA lawyers. <laughs> Y'all said, God, get some letters, you only do 30 days, everything will be fine. Well, nobody told the judge I was only gonna do 30 days, right? <laughs> and I got up and the judge said, oh, these letters are nice and everything. And she goes, but you know, that wasn't cool what you did, so you're gonna go to jail for just under a year. And she sl slammed down the gavel and my mom went, <gasps> And my sponsor, of course, went, oh. <laughs> And I went to jail. And you know what? Narcotics Anonymous came with me. You guys showed up. I mean, I never went a day without a visit that I could get one. I never went a morning without a letter. I never went without money on my books. I never went without anything. <laughs> See, our new friends in the fellowship will help us. Yeah, you know, our common effort, we have the same common effort, that's recovery and clean. We face the world together, and that's what you guys did for me. And I'm walking the, I'm walking the yard in, the, in jail one day, and this guy comes up to me, this old convict named Mel, and he says, uh, Hey, uh, Shorty. <laughs> that was my handle. I, Shorty Dog would have been all right, but anyway, we'll talk about something else. Anyway, he says, uh, you go to them Narcotics Anonymous meetings, don't you? And I was like, yeah, man, I go to them meetings. He goes, do they really tell me, do they work all right? And I was like, man, I was clean for over a year before I came here to jail, and I could not stop using. He goes, hmm. I go, dude, I was a GSR. <laughs> he didn't care. Um... And he looked at me and he said, you know, man, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired of walking the yard at Folsom. I'm tired of being in San Quentin. I'm tired of missing my kids growing up. I'll tell you what. You teach me what you know about that Narcotics Anonymous, and I'll teach you what I know about doing time, because you don't got a clue, boy. You don't got a clue at all. You're gonna get hurt. I'll get your smokes back for you, but knock that shit off and stick with me. Um, and we made that deal. And in December of last year, Mel D celebrated 16 years clean in our time. See, there ain't no. There's nothing that can hold this power of narcotics and arms back. Not no jail wall. Um, and I got out, and I'm sitting at this meeting, right? And uh, I'm hanging in a meeting, I'm feeling good, I'm just fresh out of jail, and somebody starts to play with the back of my hair. I'm like, damn, you know, I just got out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's that girl Ruth from my first meeting with Narcotics and Iron. <laughs> and... Uh, Ruth and I have been married for almost 15 years. Stand up, baby. Stand up. Stand up, honey. Yeah, baby. Ain't she something? You know, I've, I've been coming to Narcotics Anonymous a long time. And uh, I hear a lot of talk about relationships. 
And a lot of, I hear this quote all the time. Race relationships can be a terribly painful area. And you know what? It's true. They can. But this is one I don't hear. We can learn to be free to enjoy each other's companionship because we are no longer so obsessed with ourselves. Yes. I'm at the love of my life in that kind of the, the love of my life. And, uh, you know, I'm really grateful for her ability to uh, communicate with me. Uh, and her courage to tell me what's going on. And I'm really grateful for my sponsor that he taught me about the 12 traditions of Narcotics Anonymous. Go ahead, come on. Yeah. Because the traditions taught me about unity and anonymity and that nobody in a relationship is more important than the other, that we all have equal say no matter who the major breadwinner is. And that when we bring in God to our relationship, whenever we're having challenges, that we're going to be okay. Um, she's, she teaches me so much and she's so profound sometimes. Okay, I gotta share this, baby, okay? Here we go. It wasn't too long ago that uh, she came home from work and she was just in a bad mood, all right? Bad mood. And no matter what I did, it wasn't good enough. It wasn't okay, right? It, you know. And she looked at me and she said, you know what, honey? Just from this moment on, just ignore everything I say. But, don't ignore me or I'll be pissed. <laughs> yeah, that was the style. I could do that. I could do that. And now, um, and I have this beautiful daughter that that, uh, that came with Ruth and, and uh, they came together and, and, and her name is Brandy and she gave us a granddaughter uh, four years ago. My granddaughter's name is Emma. Before I talk about Emma, I gotta say one thing. The Tampa Fellowship kicks ass. <laughs> I didn't want to forget because they took us in and they fed us and they really treated us like family this weekend. And, and when you're a long way from home and you don't know a lot of people, that's really, really awesome. And the committee, oh my God, what a great party this has been, huh, you guys? Uh, Don and Rich, and God dang, you guys, thank you so much. Okay, cool, cool, I'm glad I didn't forget that. Uh, but, you know, in recovery, we can get stuck into certain, certain ruts, you know, and I recently left a job that was a very well-paying job to try to find some more balance in my life, and, and I really took a big pay cut, and, and sometimes with the pay cut, I get caught up in the I wanna's, and I wish I does, and uh, what if, and only, and all that sort of stuff, and, but you never be, you never know when the message is going to be delivered to you, or who's going to deliver it, right? And so, it wasn't but a, a little while ago, my granddaughter comes up to me, and she says, Papa... Papa, let's go outside and look at the turkeys. See, I, we have these wild turkeys by where I live. And I said, all right, baby, let's go out and look at the turkeys. And I kind of drag my feet out there. And I'm like, okay, this will be all right. And she picks up a stick and she starts pointing at all the turkeys. And she's going, poof, 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 poof. And I start to smile a little bit. And I go, honey, is that your magic wand? And she looks at me and she goes, no, Papa, that's a stick. <laughs> I'm like... Okay. My four-year-old granddaughter is more grounded in reality than I am. But it allowed me to come back to what was real, and what was real in my life at that time was very, very good, and I had no reason whatsoever to be in the what-ifs, if-onlys. Um, I got one more, a little bit more to share. I know it's getting late, but this is a real important part of my story. You guys okay? All right. So the first um, seven years of my marriage to Ruth, I had eight jobs. In recovery, I couldn't hold down a job. And this is what my pattern was like, and I didn't notice it at all, and I, I don't even know if Ruth noticed it, but what would happen is, is I would get a job, yes, yeah, she probably did. I'd get a job, and I'd do really, really well at the job, and I'd excel, and I'd be excited, and I'd be full of energy, and I'd stay up, and I could, I could go with like three or four hours sleep a night clean. People come over to my house on the weekends and like I'd have been washing my, waxing my truck since 4 o'clock in the morning. 
okay? And then I'd do really well at this job, and then all of a sudden one day I'd wake up and I'd go, oh my God, this job is just tearing the heart out of me. I can't go to this job anymore. Oh, I can't leave my room. And I would be on these really, really highs for a long time, and then I would start to go down on these really, really bad lows. And the highs were shorter and the lows were longer. And the jobs lasted a shorter period of time, and the times in which I, I started to drop became more and more frequent. And I found myself at seven years clean, driving down the road in my Toyota truck with my eyes closed and my hands spread out like this, going 90 miles an hour, just wanting to smash into something. And I didn't get it. See. I had worked the steps many times as honestly as possible. I had a God in my life that I tried to turn to, but at that point in my life, I just couldn't find the energy to do it. I didn't understand what the hell was going on. And I, I, I had, the anxiety was so bad that I literally couldn't even dress myself. And I was like, what's, what's happening to me, man? I can't be like this. I'm Dan T, man. I got seven years, man. <laughs> GSR. GSR. <laughs> um, and all I could think about was getting loaded or blowing my brains out. And I just took it moment to moment, heartbeat to heartbeat, just don't do nothing. Just don't take nothing. Just don't. And finally my wife, you know, she said, hey baby, you know what? I think this is a little beyond what I can do for you. We're going to get you. We're going to take you to the doctor. And she called my sponsor because they team up on me all the freaking time. You know what I mean? They, dang, they team up on me. And they, they went and they took me to this, my regular doctor. And my doctor said, what's wrong? And I just started bawling. I said, man, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I, I'm clean and I got everything a man could ever want. Everything a man could ever dream of. I've got all these people that love me. I have this beautiful family, but I, I just want to die. And he said, we can't help you here, but there's another hospital that can. not And seven years clean, I'm walking into Sutter Center for Psychiatry, and I got another effing wristband on. <laughs> I told you, nothing could ever happen with these wristbands, man. And I'm in there, and I'm, I'm so lost, and I'm so confused, I cannot figure out why I could be here. I had done everything you told me to. And I'm there for a couple days and still reeling with confusion. And in walks this woman and she's wearing an NA service symbol around her neck, right? And I was like, hey, are you doing an H&I meeting here in the psych ward, man? Are you going to do an H&I meeting? And she says, no. I've been clean five years. I worked the steps. I've been involved in service. I got a God of my understanding. But I, I, I can't stop thinking about dying and I don't know what to do and I need some help. And there I was, thinking I was so alone. In this hospital, and God sends this recovering angel in with five years clean to let me know that I never, ever have to walk through anything alone in Narcotics Anonymous. The ultimate weapon for recovery is the recovering addict. And I got out of this hospital, and they told me that I had this illness in, in my chemicals in my brain that was called by my manic depression, that I would have to take medication. And you know what? I said, no. <laughs> I ain't taking nothing no matter what. I was so ignorant, man, I tell you. I was so ignorant. And I was like, no, I'll do therapy, but I ain't gonna take nothing. I don't wanna not fit in in the only place in the world where I ever felt like I belonged before. I got my tissues here. This always freaking happens a lot. And, uh, you know, our, there's a pamphlet we have called In Times of Illness. And it says that uh, ignoring health problems out of e fear or ego or pride or something like that can, uh, in fact, make matters worse. And that's what happened. And finally, my sponsor and my parents and, and the people that love me around me that understood things said, they're not selling this stuff on the corner, Dan. Please, we can't watch you die. And I finally agreed to go see this doctor guy that wrote the scripts, and I agreed to just go see him. And I went, and uh, he had ordered all my files from my therapist and everything, and I went, and uh, we talked for a while, and he read my little charts, and we talked for a while, and he, he looked at me, and he said, uh, 
son, you have this illness and you have to take medication for the rest of your life or you may die. And I was devastated. And I went home and I picked up the phone and I called Ira. I called my sponsor to tell him what was going on. And I got his voicemail, right? And so I left him a message. And I just laid there on my bed and I was all curled up in the fetal position, just feeling so broken. And the phone rang and I picked it up real quick thinking it was Eyeball. That's what I call him, Eyeball. <laughs> He's the all-seeing Eyeball, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and, it, and this guy goes, hello, is this Dan T? And I'm like, uh, yeah, man, who's this? He goes, well, you wouldn't know me. My name is James. Uh, I'm from the Napa Solano area. When I was brand new, you came and shared a meeting at our Unity Day, and you shared your experience, strength, and hope. And now I'm a year clean, and I never forgot the things that you said. And I'm the chair of our men's spiritual retreat. Would you please come share with us? If you only knew what a freaking 12-step call that was. See, we never know when we pick up the phone whether it's to be a service to reach out to another addict whose life we're going to save, theirs or our own. So please, please, please pick up the phone. Now I'll give you my number. Oh, wow, okay. Um, all right, last story. Maybe. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I, and this is just a little silly story, and I always tell at the end of my, when I speak, because it's my synopsis of, of recovery and what I believe to be true in Narcotics Anonymous. I was standing outside of a meeting of NA one time, having a cigarette when I still smoked, and I, I, uh, I was out there, you know, they probably weren't talking about the right stuff in the meeting. I was standing out by myself, and I went... Yeah. I think I had the five-year know-it-alls at that time. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. Where I was at, right? And I went, and uh, that was just my story. It don't have to be your story. But I went to put my cigarette butt in the butt can, and I realized, and I looked, and there was only five, I could see that there were five butts in there. Okay? But then I could see on the ground. And I was, I was bored, and I was like, well, let me, let me count these. Five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty plus cigarette butts that far from a butt can that held five. Okay. Now I know our literature is absolutely true. It's scary true. It'll tell your future true. And and it says in there we have never seen an addict who lives the Narcotics Anonymous program relapse. Not rarely, never. And I believe that with all my heart. Unfortunately, when we get here, we don't always choose to live it. So when I, I thought when I was back in treatment and the, the, the counselor guys, they gave us treatment statistics. Anybody ever been to treatment to get those statistics? What were they? One in 10, right? This guy told me one in 10. So maybe they change. And I was like, okay, there's five butts in the butt can. There's 50 on the ground outside. Okay, I get it. The guy who hits the butt can is the guy who gets to stay clean. Because recovery is about an active change in our attitudes and behaviors. Um, and maybe the person that's willing to take that one extra step to do what they know to believe is right Maybe they're willing to stay on the phone one extra minute, go to the one extra meeting, you know, help that newcomer stay clean one extra day. But then unfortunately we have, we have those of us, unfortunately, that will just throw it on the ground. And if confronted, somebody will say, why did you do that? You know what the most often the answer is? I'm an addict. I'm an addict. Now that's about just being an ass right there. Yeah. Because I love Narcotics Anonymous, and I don't want to see one addict die because they've been told it's okay to use our disease as an excuse to behave in ways that are unacceptable to behave. 
again, I, I really got to thank you guys for being attentive and paying attention and the committee for having me out. And I hope everybody has a great weekend. And thank you so much.